So Stanford is a, a new experience for you. It's, it's different than anything you've experienced before, and you feel differently about who you are. And how, how did you begin to feel at home there? Well, it's a different world. First, for the first time, uh, I had my own room. Mm -hmm. Right? I'd grown up with uh, three brothers, uh, bunk beds or the floor. Uh, I had uh, access to a bathroom that wasn't shared by six people. Uh, I had a shower as opposed to a bathtub. Mm -hmm. I had privacy. Mm -hmm. I had three meals a day. Uh, and the most dangerous thing, I had total independence, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that could be a, a benefit or a burden. It turned out to be a benefit, but it could have been just the opposite. I met smart black people from all over the country, uh, people who were musicians, uh, who were scientists, uh, who were other artists, uh, who were um, brilliant in economics. Uh, I had never seen so many black people with so much talent in one place. So I was overwhelmed and what the world am I doing here? Mm -hmm. uh, the, on the other hand, there were but, two. But you were smart. It, it, you but were I smart. didn't know it. It's, it's sort of like, I, I it, it, to me, that was not a factor. It, mm -hmm. I, I did what needed to be done, but I had not seen in those classes in high school people mm -hmm. like me. I was the exception, and here at Stanford, I was part of a broader class, so it was empowering. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't intimidating, it was mm -hmm. empowering to see, wow, uh, this is what the world's about. And I had been sheltered from that world from my upbringing, so it was nice to see that at Stanford. At the same time, there were two experiences at Stanford that uh, were defining moments in terms of what Brown meant. Mm -hmm. uh, this is uh, 1971, 17 years after Brown, so you would think that we'd made a lot of progress. Well, we met somebody at Stanford uh, that I found to be very troubling. It's a guy by the name of William Shockley. Mm -hmm. and most people know him as a uh, brilliant physicist, uh, the inventor, uh, one of the co-inventors of the uh, transistor, uh, received the Nobel Prize. But there was a uh, dastardly and dangerous side of Shockley as well. He was a Stanford professor who advocated theories about eugenics, that whites were genetically inf uh, superior to blacks. Mm -hmm. And it even argued that there should be federal support to sterilize black women so that they would not have children because that mm -hmm. would danger the future population of the race. And so Shockley was one of these people who I had to confront as a Stanford student. Here I was, arrived at Stanford, the mecca of higher education, and having to have a faculty member tell me that we didn't belong there because mm -hmm. we were black. I thought those days were over with Brown, but we revisited them again in 1971 and 72. We had him debate two African-American professors, uh, Cedric, uh, Clark and Philip McGee, and they made him look uh, ridiculous. Uh, but that's what he wanted. He wanted the publicity. Mm -hmm. We had a packed room of uh, 2,000 people, black and white. And after he was beat up so bad, he had another theory. Okay, you're right. I may not be right about the gene genetics view about blacks, but I want some federal support for a new project. What was his new project? He wanted to get federal money to study the black students at Stanford because he believed that we probably had more white genetics in us than the normal mm -hmm. black. That explained why we were uh -huh. at Stanford. So that was the shock. So he had experience. it right either way. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so that's the Stanford uh, experience. I also, my political education came about because Angela Davis was uh, arrested. She was held at the Women's Detention Center in Palo Alto, right across the street from Stanford. And I met her. We raised money, raised funds. Uh, and she became a huge influence on in my decision to go to law school because mm -hmm. here was a black woman who was going to trial for serious murder charges and conspiracy charges. And she had th the original dream team. She had Howard Moore, a black lawyer She's from Oakland. My brother in law. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and she had uh, 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 Harold Branton mm -hmm. uh, from LA, who was yeah. a brother of Wiley Branton, mm -hmm. who argued the uh, Cooper versus Aaron case uh, and desegregated Arkansas. She had Margaret Bryn Walker, a uh, communist lawyer, one of the first black women, white women lawyers in California. Mm -hmm. And the last member of the team was Margaret Burnham, mm -hmm. who was a young woman who'd gone to school and grew up in Angeline, Alabama, worked for the NAACP uh, in New York, and uh, you know the organization, your organization's history. Yeah. Uh, she wanted to go represent Angela Davis. They said it was not a relevant case. Right. She quit Wasn't her first case. job. Yeah. She quit her first job. Can you imagine mm -hmm. the... the, the uh, uh, courage of a young lawyer just admitted to practice, mm. leaving her job to go save her friend's life. Well, you know, they wouldn't represent me when I got put out of the legislature, but that's another story. Well, that, that's the older yeah. NLACP. Yeah. I hope things have changed. They have. Right. And so that was an experience, too, going there and seeing the under Davis trial. We were all prepared in June 1972 when the jury was coming back 
uh, we assumed that she was going to get convicted because mm. it was Ronald Reagan was our governor, uh, this conservative element, Nixon was in the White House. And what chance did she have? Well, the jury came back and found her not guilty of all charges. We had to radically change our plans. We had something else planned. I can't mm. tell you what it was, uh -huh. <laughs> but the good news, we had to turn what we thought was going to be a devastating defeat into a celebration. Mm. 